Welcome to this edition of AFMC. I'll tell you how I got better. I'm glad to be here. But a mission to deliver it. Well, I think that we're, we're talking, we're going to talk about everybody's. Arkansas is the second highest prescriber. Welcome to AFMC TV. I'm Robin Ledbetter. Thank you for joining us. Today I have with me Dr. Joe Thompson, and he is the president and CEO of the Arkansas Center for Health Improvement. Dr. Thompson, thanks for joining me. Glad to be with you today. Yeah. So let's talk about long COVID okay. and the effects of, that it's having on Arkansas. Is it still something that's prevalent? Long COVID are lasting effects of having been infected with COVID that we don't truly fully understand. Uh, nationally, internationally, it's estimated 10, 15% of people that have had COVID will have long lasting effects. Usually it's in several areas, either stamina, you don't have your stamina back, respiratory, if your lungs have been affected, cognitive, if your thoughts have been affected, uh, and cardiac issues that sometimes can manifest. Uh, this is a new virus. This is a new long-term sequelae of that virus. And we're learning more and more with each passing week. And numbers are rising in our state now? Active COVID today, as of the first part of September, numbers are rising. We're seeing a doubling in the number of hospitalizations just in the last few weeks. And anecdotally, I hear a lot of folks that are saying either they or a friend have become positive. We no longer follow all the tests, so we really don't have a finger on the pulse of what's happening in the community. But when bad outcomes happen, like hospitalizations, that is a cause for concern. And coping mechanisms during COVID, we're still seeing the ramifications of that and behavioral problems, mental, mental health problems, right. alcoholism. How has that affected our state? Well, COVID was a worldwide pandemic and we had to take some pretty dramatic measures to help control and safeguard people's well-being. Uh, those isolation efforts, the disruption that affected us all in different ways, whether that was in our health care, whether that was in our education, whether that was in our ability to go to church or have social interactions, those all have laid a heavier mental health burden on individuals. I think we're all a little bit in PTSD from COVID. Uh, and those mental health bur burdens, unfortunately, are manifesting for some individuals with new depression, even severe depression, uh, or turning to substances of abuse, alcohol, other substances. And so we're seeing those increases, and I think that's a real cause for concern also. And there's some changes within the state about dispersing Narcan. Um, how, how does that work? Correct. You know, in the middle of our pandemic public health emergency with COVID, we were already in a public health emergency around opioid you know, uh, addiction. Uh, so this has made the, fir the latter worse. Uh, there are strategies now to get Narcan, the antidote for opioid overdoses broadly dispersed through the state. Our center is running a program called Naloxone where if an individual presents to the emergency room or their, with their family, they can now get free Narcan to take home to safeguard that individual after they've been discharged. And there's also been a delay in care for, for in, in a lot of ways, post um, COVID too. Um, how has that affected Arkansas? Well, during COVID, you know, the healthcare system largely shut down for a very short period of time. And then we were able to use telemedicine in new ways. Uh, and as we come out of the emergency, as we try to get back to normal, it's a new normal. Uh, some individuals have hesitancy to go to the physician because they're afraid that they could get infected again or for the first time. Uh, we've seen a drop off on preventive screening, so people aren't getting their breast uh, screening or their colorectal cancer screening. Uh, and we're seeing some people that have had chronic illnesses you know, lose control, diabetes, congestive heart failure, hypertension. So all these things are a call for physicians to re-engage, look at your patient population to make sure that those that have these conditions have come in, that you're on top of it. And if they haven't come in, to reach out to make sure that people aren't afraid to come in and to overcome that barrier. And you, you touched a little bit about mental health and the, the changes that, that that really played on all of us, the problems post-COVID too. Are we seeing suicide rates in, in certain communities, certain demographics and groups within the state? Across the board, we are seeing suicide rates increase. We're seeing drug overdose deaths also increase. So that's a, that's a hard signal that our problem is present and getting worse. One of the groups that I have the most concern for are our adolescents and, and young adults. They're particularly hit hard by COVID, by the social isolation, by the new fear that, that they, uh, as non-adults, didn't always know how to process well. We now have over a, over a fifth of our teenagers that have had suicidal ideations. It's about one in three of our girls have suicidal ideations during their high school uh, senior year. So this is a real issue that we need to ask our clinicians to inquire about and have our families watch out for.
Is it about disparities, you know, addressing disparities within healthcare too? COVID exposed the disparities that we already knew were present, but put them in fairly sharp contrast. Uh, our lower income communities, our communities of color, our African American, our Hispanic um, uh, communities, our Marshallese communities, you know, they already had access barriers or hesitancy or, or other issues that had them not get an equal access and quality of care of the majority. COVID made that even worse. And so our centers tried to highlight some of those uh, disparities so that we can start working to put safeguards in place so that they don't play out again for what the next emergency that we face is. Should there be um, an improvement or change in regards to therapists and psychiatry within the state too? Well, our mental health system was already not very well developed. You may remember before the Affordable Care Act, mental health parity wasn't even required. Insurance plans didn't have to pay for mental health services or substance abuse services. The Affordable Care Act 10 years ago required coverage for mental health services at parity but coverage alone, if you don't have the clinicians out in the workforce, doesn't get you very far. And so I think we're still a decade or so behind where the healthcare system is on having an adequate number of mental health providers adequately dispersed across the state to meet what the current demand is. And I'm hearing this trend about behavioral health and primary care and an integrative kind of a partnership. Are you seeing it move in that direction? We are seeing it clearly in some places. Uh, some of our community health centers have fully integrated behavioral health and primary care. Some of our private clinics take a little different approach. They may have both clinics side by side and they are one clinic, but on the front they look different. Uh, because of the stigma that still unfortunately is associated with individuals seeking mental health services. Uh, and then I think on the financial side, we are seeing you know, the integration of mental health and medical care, seeing positive outcomes, both clinical outcomes and also cost-saving outcomes because we're treating the whole person. We're not asking the person to go to two different places to take care of their singular needs. And we talked a little bit about disparities, but what, what populations are at risk for premature death? Is there a specific group? Without question, our, our minority populations die at a premature level to the majority. Uh, that's frequently because of education, income, access to services. Unfortunately, it's also still probably present of institutional racism. We have you know systems that don't let the minorities have the same availability of care. Uh, we also have disconnects between uh, the race and ethnicity of the provider and that of the patient so that there are communication gaps even when the visit does happen. The culture, the ethnicity, the, the uh, conversation frequently is not at the same level when we have a difference between the race or the ethnicity of the patient and that of the physician. And there's a big focus right now on the Delta mm -hmm. in a three-state project that you guys are working on. Tell me a little bit about that. We just successfully competed with the National Science Foundation for now a three-state effort, Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana, to try to bring new opportunities into these areas through healthcare delivery with technology, as we experienced during telemedicine, and also new food access points. You know, rural America nationwide is really challenged in our healthcare delivery side and in the, the availability of healthy food sourcing. And so the National Science Foundation put out a new call uh, to, to bring their funds into new solutions. Uh, with our partners in Mississippi and Louisiana, we put a pretty good grant together. And now we're on a planning process to put a new next grant in that could get over $500 million into those three states' parts of the Mississippi Delta. Wow, and how soon does that go into place? We put our grant in in 18 months, and we'll probably find out in a couple of years. Okay, a couple of years, so a little bit ahead. We've got some work to do, yes. <laughs> okay. That's exciting though, you yes. know, good, good news to think that it's that's It's always, you know, creating something new, addressing a problem, that's what our center has done. This, we're in our 25th year, and bringing data into the discussion to look for solutions, uh, we're excited about the opportunity. And there, there is a little bit of rumblings about Medicaid and what that looks like for the state and, and potential closures of ho rural hospitals. Mm -hmm. What do you see as, as the big focus that, that where we need to be headed? Sure. Well, we're in the 10th year of Arkansas's experience with Medicaid expansion. Originally the private option, now Arkansas works. Uh, we are tracking around our state and sister states around us. There have been over 60 rural hospitals close. Uh, Arkansas has had two close, but they were built back. West Memphis had a fire and they built a new hospital. The Queen uh, got in some trouble with Medicare and the county built a new hospital. So we're net, net neutral on rural hospitals. That's not to say COVID didn't stress those hospitals and increased operating costs puts new risks on those hospitals. 
Uh, but we're in better shape than any of the sister states around us. And I hope we can continue to work so that every Arkansan gets access to the care that they need when they need it in the highest quality way. Well, Dr. Thompson, thanks so much for sharing great information about where we're headed and where we've been and how hard we're all working for a better Arkansas. Thank you for having me. Be glad to come back anytime. Thank you. And that's it for this episode of AFMC TV. I'm Robin Ledbetter. Have a great day and thanks for watching.